All right, oh. guys. Episode number 35, The Disappearing Dollars in the Nursing the Company Back to Health. 35? 35. We're on a roll. I can't believe it. <laughs> and to believe, people once said that I could never commit to anything. <laughs> <laughs> or multitask? Did they ever tell you that? Because you sure have multiple tasks going on. Oh, goodness. Yes, yes. Multitasking. Yes, I've heard that one before, too. You can't multitask. You are correct. That is why sometimes this show is a train wreck. And <laughs> Heather says, happy late birthday, Robert. Thank you very much, Heather. I am 21 years old again. <laughs> Hal says, mellow music. Yes, Hal. We were trying to get people to mellow out so that everyone could be like Stephanie with her wine from mm. Seattle. And Heather says, stressed, but got a week to relax. Heather, are you not going to work next week at all? I mean, Thanksgiving is on Thursday. What are you doing? Just taking the whole week out? You're giving thanks <laughs> all week. I am. I am too. I'm with Heather. I'm giving thanks all all week next week. Ah, nice, nice. Yes, that is right, Shri. Episode thirty-five. Wow. Who said I wasn't good at long-term commitments? Doggone it. <laughs> so <laughs> it hasn't been a year yet. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? That's a good point. Hey, we're getting close, point. though. We started in March. You, it's going to be March before you know it again. Yeah. yeah, it really is. All right, guys. So on a serious note, well, kind of serious note, the Friday Froster. We are available on all of your favorite podcasting platforms, including Apple. And you guys know how I feel about Apple. So, you know, hey, jo <laughs> don't even don't even go there with me right now. So, <laughs> so if you guys don't, if you're if you're watching live or you watch the replay, you'll notice Joe's background is a little bit different. Switching it up because my Apple desktop computer decided to go fooey, so that's why. So that's well, why Robert's making fun of me. I was about to ask Joe, how do you feel about Apple, but. Don't Still not me. selling my Apple stock. <laughs> now the stock I would definitely keep. I'm I'm with you on the stock, but um, but Joe, how do you feel about Apple right now? Okay, so it's a good thing you know we can't just reach through computer screens right now because I'd be in real trouble. Yeah, don't don't push my buttons, Robert. All right, guys, let's just get right into the first story today. You've seen the title. The disappearing dollars. So this story, man, this one, you know what? I got to stop saying this every week because it seems like every week I say this one, you're going to just want to listen to because this one is crazy. But this one actually is crazy. So listen, Friday, July 11th, 1969. Theater John Conrad walked into his job at the Society National Bank at 127 Public Square in Cleveland. He was just an ordinary bank teller. At the end of the day, he walked out with $215,000. He put it in a paper bag. So he just vanished with a paper bag full of $215,000. Now, it was not until recently that he was found. Here's what happened, though. A year before the bank robbery, he became obsessed with the 1968 movie with Steve McQueen called The Thomas Crown Affair. The movie was based on a bank robbery for sport. See, a millionaire decided he wanted to rob a bank, and he did. So Conrad saw the movie more than a dozen times, and from then on, he bragged to his friends about how easy it would be to rob a bank and even told his friends that he planned to do so. The Fugitive Investigation 
perplexed many investigators for over the last 50 years. You see, he was even featured on the Amer on the on America's Most Wanted and Unsolved Mysteries. Investigators chased leads across the country, including Washington, D.C., Inglewood, California, Western Texas, Oregon, and Honolulu, Hawaii. But the case remained closed and cold. I'm sorry, the case remained cold until just a few weeks ago. United States Marshals from Cleveland, Ohio, traveled to Boston, Massachusetts. They positively identified Thomas Randell of Linfield, Massachusetts. Now, that was the fictitious name that Theodore J. Conrad was using. He had been living an unassuming life in the Boston suburb since the 1970s. Now, ironically, he moved to Boston near the location where the original Thomas Crown Affair movie was filmed. Now, you're probably wondering, how in the world did they catch this man? United States Marshals from Cleveland, they were able to match documents that Conrad had completed in the 1960s to documents that Randell had completed, including documents from where Randell filed for bankruptcy in Boston Federal Court in 2014. Now, they're saying that additional investigative information led marshals to positively identify him. They didn't say what that information was. Unfortunately, he died of lung cancer in May of 2021, so in May of this year, in Linfield, Massachusetts, using his date of birth as July 10th, 1947, when his real birth date was July 10th, 1949. So he shaved a few years off there. He would have been 71 at the time of his death so all right i think joe disappeared for a minute but joe is back i've been here i was just backstage don't mind oh, me oh no <laughs> wait a minute are you on a mac now i'm sorry joe that was, I, that was i said in the comments my apples none of them like me today my apple not my friend today sorry or this week all right don't say oh. anything wrong <laughs> no comment. No comments from the peanut gallery there. I'm back. <laughs> Apparently not. So so look, guys, now, what, what do you guys think about this story? This is insane. Before we dive into it, I want to show you guys something. Wait, before before we do that, let's go to a few comments. Let's go to a few comments. So Heather said that she needs to take her PTO. And Pozo is here and Pozo says, Happy Friday. And Kim, the best sales coach in the world, is here. Hey, Kim. And how fooey. Is that a technical <laughs> Apple term? No, it's <laughs> iFooey. <laughs> is that what Hal said? And I just messed it up. Oh, no. It is iFooey. That's a good catch, Kelly. It should be iFooey. Dan I says conflicts of interest. Apple versus Apple stock. Hmm. Very interesting. Now, you guys want to see something real cool, though, as we're interacting with our friends in the chat. Today, I'm going to try something real different. As they start talking, it is going to show up over here on the right-hand side so that everyone can see it, no matter where you're watching us. So now, Kelly, Joe, what do you guys think about this story? Okay, well, first off, the marshals got him. And um, remember Tommy Lee Jones and um, Harrison Ford in The Fugitive. Okay, if I'm a fugitive, like a federal fugitive, the fu the marshals are going to be the ones who find. It's not the FBI. It will be the marshals. They are like, I trained with marshals. I worked with a marshal. We got to drive around, no joke, in his white van that he must have had a year's worth of RV wrappers in it. And we found a fugitive. Like these guys, they're scary good. Like if I wanted to do like work for the feds, it would be for the marshals just because they track money. They like asset forfeiture. They are, they're top notch, man. They're going to find you. They will hunt you down and they will find you. I love Kelly's life. She's so much more fun than us. Right. Right. I mean, look at she is. We could make a movie out of Kelly's life experiences. I think we oh, should. God. Yeah. See so, Kelly, what's the difference between the FBI and the Marshals? <laughs> uh oh. Okay, Hal. 
<laughs> and Mark Ander it wait, Mark Anderson isn't here. Okay. Um, I don't think there's like a, you know, the acronym for FBI. There's all sorts of forever bothering Italians or <laughs> there's all sorts of acronyms for the FBI. And I'm not going to go there and lose our, half our audience. I don't know of an acronym for um, uh, the U.S. Marshals. And hell, I'm going to tell you something right now. It's Marshals with only one L. One L. Oh. oh. Okay. Yeah. And Good. you know what? So many people get that wrong. Did not know that. Yes. So if you see someone and they use the word marshals, like a, a reporter, you're like, mm, no, you guys haven't done your research. It's oh. one L. You mean like typos in articles? Oh, can't wait to talk yeah. about <laughs> Yo, that. <laughs> typos in articles. That's going to be hilarious. That Paul was my that, only purpose to be on today's show was to find a typo in one of the articles. You know that, right? <laughs> uh, that is so not true. Yeah. <laughs> Pal says the marshals can figure out complex cases and come up with something other than wire fraud. Yes. Oh now, my God, yes. For those of you who don't get that, if you're not regulars here, almost every case we have where there's some sort of money laundering and all kinds of vile things that take place, when you look at what they were indicted on, it is usually wire fraud. And we've determined that that's the easiest thing to actually get a conviction on. And so everybody is convicted of wire fraud. And Heather, Heather, <laughs> Heather <laughs> wait a minute, I missed the wrong one. Heather says, Marshalls is the store. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's kind of like safety deposit box. Everyone says safety deposit box. Right. It's safe deposit. Exactly. It is safe deposit yeah. box. Yes. It's <laughs> okay. like, um, okay, wait, I want to do one. It's like, um, irregardless. It's oh. Regardless. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> hey, I got another one. I got another one. Okay. Some people say it's a mute point, but it's a moot point. It's moot. moot. M-O-T. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. 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 This is totally okay. off, off the thing. Okay. I was flying home last night. You guys already know you track me around the world flying home last night. <laughs> I'm going to tell you people, if you have something that is confidential, don't open your computer. Oh my gosh. I could tell you all sorts of things about a company, but the funniest thing is someone's looking at a P&L looking very, very hard at a PL. And then all of a sudden he puts up Investopedia, difference between profit and loss and net income. He's on the board. I was like, and my husband does not find this humorous. He's like, you are a creeper. He's on the board. He's reading a PL and then he has to go to Investopedia to find out the difference between PL and net income and then he pulls up cost of goods sold i honestly oh I, I kelly to kelly i know it's off topic too but you should tell everybody about the other thing that happened the person you were sitting by on the beach that mm -hmm. said uh it was something about uh stealing from their office or something <gasps> oh oh my gosh oh this is so funny this okay. is so funny okay so you know, I'm sitting at the pool and this woman from Minnesota and everyone knows Minnesotans are so nice, starts talking to me, blah, blah, blah. And then she mentions that she's like, oh yeah, I, my brother's a pilot. So I get to fly everywhere for free. And, um, uh, Hal, you have to listen. Um, and she's like, and I don't, you know, I don't have my physical therapy practice. Um, I have the best office manager ever. He never takes vacations, not even with his family. And so, yeah. okay, yeah. I'm going to tell you, I didn't tell her. You didn't say anything. I, I was wondering the end of the story there. I brought out my fraud magazine. She saw it. Um, she was on vacation. I can yeah. track her down. But you know what? <laughs> the Don't, be a creeper. Is, Don't be a creeper, mm. Kelly. Well, it's being a creeper. And also she's been through cancer three times and oh. survived, which I was like, wow. But then my brain is like, 
oh my God, he's stealing while she has cancer. Oh Lord. Yep. It won't be the first or the last time. So I did not say anything to her because I just I couldn't bring myself to ruin her. Oh wow. Life. Heather, yeah. I know I didn't I tried. Yeah, because yeah. he's yeah. it's yeah. not gonna end well. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, thank you, Joe. Yeah. And here's what our guy looked like way back in the day. So there's our guy way back in the day. Uh-oh, Joe disappeared on us again. <laughs> and she's back. Oh, my gosh. I'm sorry. <laughs> Apple is just not I, your I, friend today, Joe. I think the week should, be, should have ended yesterday at like 5 o'clock. <laughs> sorry. I'm with you. I'm here. Okay, so, so check this out. Here's what our guy looked like back then. So let's go back to the story now. Peter J. Elliott. United States Marshal for Northern Ohio stated, this is a case I know all too well. My father, John K. Elliott, was a dedicated career duty de uh, deputy United States Marshal in Cleveland from 1969 until his retirement in 1990. My father took an interest in this case early because Conrad lived and worked near us in the late 1960s. My father never stopped searching for Conrad and always wanted closure up until his death in 2020. We were able to match some of the documents that my father uncovered from Conrad's college days in the 1960s with documents from Randell that led to his identification. I hope my father is resting a little easier today, knowing his investigation and his United States Marshals Service brought closure to this decades long mystery. Everything in real life doesn't always end like in the movies. So. This is such a good story. Yep. So he was a marshal. Like this is, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. No, I was just saying, this is just, a, you, we've never done one like this. So it was kind of fun, different. Yeah. Very different. But here's something that I'd like to bring up from an auditing and an auditor's perspective as it relates to this case. Uh, so. <laughs> I'm not the only one with technical difficulties today. No, you are not. I'm having some technical difficulties today because I'm using new software. And I'm getting the hang of it. So, Hal said, so what happened to the bank robber? Hal, where have you been, man? He, uh, he, he passed away, unfortunately, uh, earlier this year. But for auditors, risk, compliance, and fraud professionals, this underscores the importance of having really good documentation. You have to think about it. When all of this happened, we had no electronic work papers. This stuff was probably stored on microfiche. I mean, just in all seriousness. But because someone or a series of people documented their work papers very well, we were able to find this individual based on documents from the 60s. So, Kelly, what do you think about the importance of work papers? You know, when you put together documentation, when you're investigating something. It's so important. And I mean, I worked with someone who took no notes, like, you know, it's the hit by the bus theory. What, what if, you know, or someone just leaves the industry or something like that and you haven't done anything like, why would you not? I, I just, you have to document stuff. And, um, yeah, I was just reading a book on vacation and there's a really funny part in there about, the lawyer ended up paying for him or wait, was it the, the lawyer didn't pay for the bill. So the, the bad guy paid for the bill and he had like the marked bills and it's how the case like came. So um, <laughs> just like, it's the little teeny things that get people, you know, I'm going to say strung up. <laughs> so you've got to write down the little teeny things. Why do you think it took this long, though? That's my question on this one. 
Well, they said he lived a very quiet life. Yeah, um, and, he, and he changed his name, right? Robert, you said that part, right? Yeah, Already. he changed his name, lived a really quiet life. Yeah. And yeah, um, so he, <laughs> um, there was a bankruptcy filing in a Boston federal court, and I haven't gotten that, um, which is like, mm, that's kind of interesting. I actually, maybe if I'm bored this weekend, I'll pull up his bankruptcy filing and see what he filed for bankruptcy. Like what, you know, that's kind of interesting. Yeah, I read that too. Cause, and that's what made me think why, you know, I, I mean, obviously he did a few things in the public eye. So yeah. interesting. I like how Pozo asked if there's a movie and a book on this. I don't know if you were here in the beginning, but I like the connection to the Thomas Crown affair because I love those movies. Yeah. What's the Pierce Brosnan or whoever played it like more more recently than the old movie version? I love those movies with Renee Russo. She's like my favorite. Yep. Yeah. So Beautiful. kind of they say he wanted to be just like a movie. So maybe it was kind of the reverse. There's not a movie. Yeah. Anyway. So Joe, yeah. what, do you, what? what do you think about the importance of documentation, Joe? I mean, look at this. This is a 50... 254 whatever year old case that was solved by good documentation yeah. yeah i mean i i'm all i'm an auditor too just like you robert you know i still do that um i don't the one thing though you know that we haven't talked about is the flip side of that coin like yes documentation retention is great but all of our companies have to have a policy on how long we keep stuff too mm. so you know there's a flip side to this and you know, obviously we like that he, you know, we caught this guy 52 years later. And, um, but I know the company I worked for, we had a seven year retention, right? So, I mean, we, we didn't even have a lot. And yes, if it's a fraud that goes to litigation, there's reasons we keep stuff longer, right? But um, anyway, we just thought I'd bring up that point. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point, yeah. Well, and people's tenure is so short these days at places. Mm -hmm. So you're losing so much of institutional knowledge. It's a little different in the government. Um, but like, we've got to be able to keep that institutional knowledge. So yeah, a question I for you, Kelly. Stephanie says, if you told her, would that make your vacation tax deductible as a business expense? <laughs> And I the don't. correct answer is, um, let me get with my bookkeeper on that, or my tax professional on that, and I'll get back. <laughs> now, now, Shri says that was a great question because, uh, you know, if you had told her on a vacation, she would have had to open the can of whoop, you know what, when she got back. So. <laughs> I love it. All right. So, all right, you guys. This first case was pretty interesting, right? Uh, a bank robber walked out of a bank in 1960 something with $215,000 in cash. And he was found just this year. Uh, and he unfortunately passed away of lung cancer. And they're saying that the money he stole right now would be worth $1.7 million, I think they said. Um, mm -hmm. But obviously, he still had money trouble because he filed for bankruptcy a few years ago. So even with you know, the, the, the cash injection from the bank robbery, he still couldn't stretch it long enough until he died. That's very unfortunate for the thief. <laughs> All right. So that's our first story. And we just wanted to say to, to do that story because it's kind of fun and it kind of underscores the importance of documentation and work papers, because that's important for auditors. Right. But Joe found something that, uh, well, Ah, I just got to show it to you guys. Well, it's no the next word. one, right? Yeah. No. Well, not the next story. The the typo you found. Yeah, that's a, that was in the next story, though. Oh, was, was it? The Wait a minute. The story. Uh huh. Yeah. So you got to do I the next that. One. Okay. Never mind. Before we go to the next story, then let's talk about a couple things that we are working on. Joe Kelly, you guys got something called fraud and pop culture, or pop culture and fraud. Wait a minute. What is it called? Fraud and pop culture. Ooh, mm -hmm. what are we doing with fraud and pop culture? Go ahead, Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are writing off going to the movies every week. No, 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 no. no. As a business <laughs> expense? No. Yes. Um, you know what? No one does this. And like, 
again, okay, huge shout out to my husband teaching history with film. We retain stuff visually and like fraud in pop culture is this way. Um, and this is the next generation. So we, Joe started it with the uh, book club and mm -hmm. then I threw in the movies and then I realized, gee, my husband's kind of a genius about this. And so we do fraud and pop culture. And honestly, the reviews we get are pretty awesome. They are. It's fun. It's because we're fun. And Hollywood loves fraud. And we love fraud. So we why not just do a presentation, a CP presentation on it? So if anybody's on that's part of an IIA chapter or an ACFE chapter, you know who your two favorite gals are to do fraud and pop culture, right? There's our plug, yeah. selfish plug. <laughs> now, how can they find out about that if they want to partake in the fraud and pop culture? Well, it's actually on my website right now under education services. So if you go to um, auditconsultingeducation.com, there is a services tab and then education, and you can click and get the PDF of the program summary that's got all the the learning summary learning objectives and Kelly and I's bio on it. So in a two pager, three pager. Now, how often do we do this? We do this whenever we get hired. Yeah. <laughs> So who's going to hire us next? We just did it. We did it in Colorado for the Rocky Mountain Area Conference, which is a huge accounting conference here. Uh, then we did it for the New York State Internal Controls Association. Um, so we've done it a couple times this year. It's been really fun. So fraud and pop culture, where we will talk about fraud and pop culture. So go to Joe's website if you guys want to see that at your local event, because Seeing these two in action is like magic. And you will have a whole lot of fun. And guess what? Oh, yay. Tania said that you did their presentation for her organization and everyone enjoyed it. Every single person. <laughs> Every no, person no, wait. There's it. always one. There's uh, always no, one. There's always one, yeah. Always one. So, But not in this group. I don't honestly think we have one in this group. Yeah, I don't no, think so. That was good. Good group. So here's what I want to talk about, you guys. Yeah. Rob, what are you doing? What am I doing? So yeah. I'm talking about how to influence while auditing. Now, I have this nice one hour presentation that I do telling auditors how to be more influential because, well, I always say. You can be the smartest person in any room, and that really doesn't matter because people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So I've done this presentation a few times all the way in the UK just a few weeks ago, and then I did it for our Innovative Auditor Challenge. But what I'm doing now is this same presentation is now available on demand on my website, One Hour of CPE, Influencing While Auditing. And right now, Right now, guess what, you guys? It is 48% off because I just turned 48 years old. So to celebrate my birthday, you can get this course one hour, one hour at 48% off the regular price. Go to my website, thatauditguy.com. Go to the store and look for Influencing While Auditing. If I can, I'll try to drop a link into the, uh, into the uh, chat to take you directly to it, but it's not that difficult to find and all auditors need to learn the art of influencing. It is extremely, extremely important because again, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And Maliska has arrived and she said, love that quote. And Hal said, if you are the smartest person in the room, then you're in the wrong room. You'll never learn anything. And I say, if I'm the smartest person in any room, you better run away real fast because there's a there's an extreme problem. Something is really going on with the IQ level in that room. And thank you very much, Tania. Thank you very much. Um, now, you know what, though? I noticed no one said, well, gee, you don't look 48. So I must look my I, age now. I, was about to, I didn't want to interrupt you. You kept talking. But I was like, there is no way you're 48, Robert. Shut up. <laughs> I was going to say it. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid I actually look my age now. Darn it. <laughs> what's, what's that, Kelly? Okay, I just turned something with a nine at the end. 
I'm not going to say what. 49? <laughs> 39. Thank you. 39. 39. Um, so do you know that, I think I may have said this, maybe I said it in a different group is, um, people who run marathons, 29, 39, 49 people who have affairs, 29, 39, 49. It's the last year of that decade. So, um, yeah. So watch out guys. I, you know, goodness knows what's going to happen in my nine ender year. Oh no. Kelly, when's your birthday? <laughs> I was in Mexico for my birthday. I had some, maybe a margarita. This week was your birthday? Yeah. It was last week. Well, happy last birthday. Week. You didn't tell you us. Did? You didn't tell us. Happy I'm late shy. birthday. I know. Birthday. I'm shy. Hard to believe. <laughs> now, Hal says he and his wife don't look 48 either. <laughs> <sighs> So wait a minute. Does that mean I actually have to run a marathon next year? Mm -hmm. I, I did my first marathon at 39, literally like three days before I turned 40. Yeah, but I, I'll, I'll be 49. That, that's 10 whole more years. Do I? Do I, <laughs> I mean, I'm not married, so I won't be having an affair, right? So. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> And Pozo says, happy belated birthday, Kelly. I think at one point we talked about this because I said, oh, no, you're both Scorpios. I remember this now. <laughs> you know what? I do remember that. I do remember this. Now I feel terrible. Me too. <laughs> I feel bad now. Hey, right. you know what, though? So with our next story, man. <sighs> All right, you guys. I, I just. <clears throat> nursing the company back to health. All right. So. Some assisted living executives, they pled guilty to wire fraud to Hal's point. And it was due to a multi-million dollar Ponzi scheme. All right, here goes. From at least December 2014 to 2017, the defendants operated a fraudulent scheme involving the misappropriation of proceeds raised through the offer and sale of membership interest in limited liability companies. They raised more than $10 million from at least 62 different investors. $10 million from at least 62 different investors. But check out how bad these guys were. So one of them, his name was Finner, his last name. He's an ordained Orthodox Jewish rabbi and well regarded in the Jewish Orthodox community on Chicago's north side near the suburbs. He exploited those relationships by soliciting members of the Orthodox Jewish community to invest in his scheme. Now, his partner did something very, very similar. So what they would do is they would use some of the investor funds to purchase facilities uh, uh, that were, well, not doing so well. They frequently misappropriated the investor funds upon receipts for various purposes, including paying promised distributions to their investors, supporting struggling facilities, paying back loans at other facilities and their own personal use. So they had all these LLCs. Some of them were doing well. Some of them were not doing well. As they got in money from investors, they would use them to pay down debt at some of the struggling facilities, to pay expenses at some of the struggling facilities, to pay back bank loans for some of the struggling facilities and to buy things for themselves personally. Kelly, Joe, I see Kelly is hashtagging. <laughs> of course she is. Um, because. So, go ahead. We had, we had um, I'm, well, not similar. Like, nursing homes, 
Like, oh my God, there's so much money there. Again, healthcare. We should just make it Friday fraudster healthcare version. Um, you know, the, oh my God, so many. We could just do Friday fraudster assisted living, you know, or elderly care or Medicare. Like, um, or we could do Ponzi schemes. Yeah, like how oh. just put up because didn't we just talk about this with the solar panels? Like I was like, it was like oh, reading yeah. the same thing, just a different industry with the investors and using early investor money to pay off, you know, uh, you know, whatever, or late investors paying off early investors, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Okay. So this is his LinkedIn about. My primary focus is assisting tenants and ownership develop and implement strategic real estate plans, including acquisition and disposition and lease negotiation. I conduct extensive market due diligence in order to maintain comprehensive command of current market information and provide clients with real time information. Oh my God. Like <laughs> I, it's word salad. It's just like word, word salad. Um, I don't think he went to, oh wait, it says he did Talmudic law. So again, this is also like an affinity. It's, you know, Bernie Madoff. Bernie Riddle. Madoff, yep. I was, they that went was after, you know, the Jewish faith members. Yep. I was gonna say that too, actually. That's, as soon as I read it, my mind went to Bernie again, of course. Yep, yep. So, okay, so check this out. Here is, what they did. So they would have these memorandums of understanding between the entities and between the uh, uh, themselves and the investors in the LLCs. So in one of them, or in a few of them, they would often state that the investment was low risk, that it was anticipated that investors would receive a complete return of their investment within three to five years. And for certain of the entities, the investors would receive an additional windfall return upon sale of the property. So, um, you know, as Kelly says in the Theranos case, it's hard not to shame, victim shame the investors who should have done more. What are your two favorite words for this one, Rob? Due diligence. Due diligence. So when do we say, you know, what, you know, whose fault is it really in some of these cases? But let's let's talk about the big red flag, though. Kelly just read his LinkedIn profile where he said he does due diligence right now. There's definitely a conflict of interest if you are doing due diligence on a deal that you are also selling and trying to get investors to invest in. Mm -hmm. did, I, did, did I miss something there? No. And Kelly, this kind of reminds me of WeWork a little bit. Yeah. I mean, Semi with Adam Newman. I mean, he started, I mean, a little bit different, but conflict of interest, right? Uh, Adam Newman would buy the real estate, which then he would lease back to WeWork, his company in which he was a CEO. So he could raise prices at any time, you know, to get money in his pocket for, you know, owning the building. Anyway, all sorts of issues. I'm loving this, Kelly. How about don't diligence? <laughs> you know, look, here's the deal too. So first of all, he guaranteed a return within three to five years. No investment can guarantee you a return. But here's what's really unfortunate about this. Because they were all LLC, they most likely weren't corporations that had internal auditing functions. And they probably didn't even have good external auditing functions. The books probably were never audited at all because these were just LLC structures. So... What you have now is all of these LLCs that are daisy chained together and just borrowing money, robbing Peter to pay Paul. No one's doing any due diligence, not even the investors. I think that's a shame. But again, when someone guarantees you a certain rate of return and then tells you that you're going to have a windfall or something, and then the person who's actually selling it to you specializes in doing due diligence, and you didn't bring in your own independent person to do due diligence, man, the flags are just waving here. Yeah. 
He's Maybe. wearing a pink shirt in his um, uh, Facebook <laughs> profile. But see, this is like he's an executive, so it wouldn't be pink collar crime. But then I was Googling him, and it also shows that he's bookkeeper. Like, okay, what CEO Wait, what? would even allow his name to be bookkeeper? So, I, you know. Oh. Interesting. Yeah. So this whole thing stinks. Now, Pozo is wondering, will there be a um, NFT Ponzi scheme coming soon? Yes, there will be. There's probably so many Ponzi schemes out there. If you oh think about God. the world. Well, I mean, because interest rates are at zero. Yeah. And people think like, well, I missed the stock market. Crypto's mm -hmm. too high. This is where, this is where, Ponzi schemes and affinity frauds happen is like, people are like, well, and I can't keep my money under my mattress because there's inflation. And so the inflation is going to push investors to, you know, as we well, used to call it, you know, seek yield, chase yield. Well, and the sad state of things is that fake it till you make it is still a very prevalent unethical mantra that people are out there living. And I feel like that's, you know, they're faking it, hoping that they get the returns, hoping, but they're, you know, it gets them into this Ponzi seems theme cycle, whatever you want to call it. But it's, it's that mentality, which I hate. Yep. Well, and, and, and Hal makes a very good point. Any Ponzi scheme relies on trust and promises of outsized returns. If someone doesn't apply buyer beware, then as far as Gump says, stupid is as stupid does. Mm -hmm. and, and there are clearly some lessons here for auditors, fraud professionals, compliance professionals. Anytime someone promises something, they can't do that. Anytime mm -hmm. <clears throat> there's a conflict of interest when your company is going through a merger and an acquisition, you should probably take a look at that. It's um, it's like the exam rules that we get taught when we go to take an exam. It's like what what words do you always cross out, or the answers always <laughs> like uh, yeah, yeah, it's like too yeah. good to be true, or like those like uh, anyway. That's what we need to start doing. Let's cross those out. Darn it! I sound like I'm victim shaming again. <laughs> You're good. I'm trying not to, but it's hard. Now, Hal says the Dow is up over 16% this year. So, yeah, there are returns out there. 16% yeah. is actually really good. My Apple stock's up more. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it is. You know, I, I believe in Apple stock, just not products. <laughs> well, and... Can I just bash Apple one more time? Because my my screen, so first I froze on my screen. So I have no idea what facial expressions I've been making. Uh, <laughs> and now Kelly's completely frozen on my screen. So I cannot at all see what Kelly's facial expressions are doing. So Rob, I'm just looking at you, buddy, right now. <laughs> I have no idea what's happening around me. Everything looks pretty good on this side, but you know okay, what? Good. So, so look, you guys, so we've been talking about our first story today. We talked about a bank robber who robbed a bank in the 1960s. They caught him this year because they had good paperwork. So they were able to preserve paperwork from the 1960s. So for my auditors, you all need to make sure that your work papers are documented very well. Now, in our second story, we're talking about a Ponzi scheme where they schemed over 70 investors for something like, I think I said $10 million or $17 million or something like that. All because they didn't do any due diligence. Well, maybe they did do some. They did not do adequate due diligence. The guys promised them a certain rate of return within a few years. He even promised windfall profits. He even promised that, well, he even does due diligence work himself. And so there was a conflict of interest. Auditors, you got to watch out for things like that. But Joe, Joe found an article talking about this story that, well, let's just say, hmm. I audited the article. She audited the article. And let's talk about what we, well, what she found in this article. So Finner, an Orthodox Jewish rabbi, is charged with 10 counts of wire fraud. Vaver is charged with one count of wife fraud. <laughs> I 
I'm sorry. If that doesn't make you guys giggle, that's just awesome. It is. You know what, though? I'm pretty sure his wife left him after he got convicted. <laughs> I was going to say when I wrote, when I sent it to you guys, I was going to say, is this another, is this like an affair? Like, what's wife fraud mean? <laughs> Florida man knows. Florida. Man. Well, Hal is giving a thumbs down to Apple, and Shri is saying, Things seem janky. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So, yeah, guys, today was a fun episode. Are we updating on a previous story? Are we? uh... Oh, wait a minute. Yeah. Oh, crap. You You know what? Robert. Yeah, I'm a slacker because I did put that in there, didn't I? Yeah, we were going to talk about the romance scam again and the uh, give an update on the the law, which is kind of a great transition from wife fraud. <laughs> it is a great transition if I can actually um, find the thing. I am all off this week, you guys, so you all have to Hal, excuse me. Hal asked if husband fraud was illegal. I, if wife fraud is illegal, <laughs> husband fraud is illegal too, Hal. We got it. I mean, it's like equality, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. So if you guys remember the story that we talked about last week, the romance fraud where uh, many individuals are, well, they're being defrauded online because they're meeting men and women who are robbing them blind. People are looking for love online and they are not finding it. Instead, what they're finding is that they're losing money because they're being robbed blind. Well, we have a follow up to that story. But before we get to the follow up, I think I can actually pull up um, some stats for us that I showed last week as well regarding romance fraud. Um, Let's see here. Here we go. So reported cybercrime losses in 2020 in the U.S. Uh, BEC and similar email scams, which that was what business email fraud, I think, uh, 190, uh, $1.9 billion in losses, and then confidence or romance fraud, $600 million. So if you're sitting here on these dating websites, get off of them because people are scheming on these dating websites. So if you're sitting here on these dating websites, get off of them. But we have an update because over in the UK, we talked about some women that were defrauded substantial amounts of money and they were trying to get the money back from the banks. Well, over in the UK, there is a law that requires banks under certain circumstances to give money back. So Regulators will force the UK's 14 big banking groups to publish data on this type of fraud and the reimbursement. So a total of 355 million pounds was lost through so-called authorized push payment fraud, APP fraud. Hmm. So Um, I have a friend whose mom, she hasn't fallen completely for it, but one of the ways they do it is, you know, they're chatting online and everything like this. And it's like, oh, I want to send you a dozen roses for your birthday. Address, date of birth. Yeah. And so my friend tells me this, that oh my my mom says he's going to send her a dozen red roses. And I'm like... Address, date of birth, new, uh-uh. Like, uh, that is, yeah, yeah. Wow. That is very, very, very scary and very interesting. You know, someone was actually very kind enough to send me something for my birthday, and they asked me for my address, but they didn't ask me for my date of birth. They knew it. Well, I guess not the year maybe, but. But they could have backed into it and robbed me blind could have and love is blind rob so be careful um i oh want boy. to talk one other thing in the article or in one of the articles that you found 
Um, the banks want to know, or the people defending the banks want to know, when are other organizations like social media or these online dating platforms um, needing a play to needing a part to play in tackling the fraud as well? So I thought that was a good question. I mean, we kind of talked about it when we did this story, but I mean, when yeah. is who's who all's responsibility is it? Yeah. So Stephanie says she had a customer that lost over one hundred and thirty thousand dollars and counting in a romance scam. Sad. Very really sad. sad. And then Hal is spot on. A lot of it is not is underreported or unreported due to the embarrassment factor. And Heather, Heather I love Heather. Heather said, I'm not going to give money to anyone. I just don't understand people giving thousands uh, to near strangers. I will never be that lonely. And if you got see, I know Heather and I can just picture her saying it. And I just I can just hear your voice in my head, Heather. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, and uh, Shri says there are women who would give the info. And if they are smart enough to figure out how old they are, they can get uh, they can get the year. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what do you mean? Just women? There are men, too, who get taken blind by women at some point. I mean, you've heard of the Black Widow. I mean, <laughs> she said that, ooh. too. <laughs> oh, OK. There it is. Even yeah. men. <laughs> <laughs> oh. He said so, it yeah. fast. Oh, OK. I'm just a little <laughs> slow over here. But yeah. yeah. But no. So that's a follow up to the romance fraud, though. There, there actually are laws on the books uh, over in Europe in certain parts of the UK um, uh, that are requiring banks to repay the money. And the good question is, though, what about the dating platforms themselves? What about social media sites like, well, LinkedIn and or Facebook and or MySpace, if it's still around? Um, at some point, it, my only fear with a lot of this is how far do we go where we remove personal accountability? I do think that it's sad when people lose so much money. And I think there probably is something that should be a red flag at a bank. You know, someone comes in and they keep withdrawing so much of their money. But when do you get to a point where people begin to be reckless and start having fraud schemes because they know they can be reimbursed for this money? Good question. Yeah, yeah. And Stephanie says uh, this this was a man who had lost his wife. Oh, mm, oh, bad. so his wife died and he was looking for love and he got taken to the bank. That's super sad, Stephanie. <sighs> yeah. But a lot of these frauds are sad, right? Not just the romance ones. Yeah, yeah. Not just the romance ones. So, guys, Dan said he enjoyed the episode. He's going to drop off for a meeting. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving to you, Dan. Always great to have you on. So first story for today. What was the first story? I forgot the first story. The bank robber. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah the bank, bank robber. robber who got caught after 50 years. Second story. Uh. Man, those guys with the Ponzi scheme for the LLCs and an update. Here's what I want to know from you guys who listen every week, because there's quite a few of you. Now that we have a thousand episodes, OK, just 35. But now that we have 35 episodes, would you guys like for us to go back to some of the previous stories and do a where are they now or here's what happened? Because that's what we've been thinking about, because we've done some really cool stories over the last 35 episodes. Um, and if so, which ones were your favorite ones that you'd like to see an update on? Um, you know, with that like, said, go ahead. Like, poop, like the poop company. Oh, you know company. what? Wasn't that our first episode? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I know, Benita, she can't believe it. 35 episodes already. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. 35, Benita. 35. The only hey, problem with the recaps are sometimes it's years. I mean, I have a woman who's she's going on four for the you know adjudication. 
Yeah, there may be a lot on some of them we've done this year from this year. Yeah, yeah. hopefully. Hey, um, are we doing one next Friday? Or are we off for Thanksgiving? We should just go ahead and tell everyone before. Oh, you know what? Yeah, we should probably be off for Thanksgiving. I think yeah, so. I can't Let's make all, it. Yeah, spend time yeah. with our families. You guys have an enjoyable Thanksgiving too. Yeah, I'll, I'll run a rerun or may, maybe if I have time, I may actually put together some best of stuff, maybe possibly. But don't do too much, Robert. Enjoy your week off too. Yeah, or your oh. days. I, I have nothing to do but work. I'm on a mission here. I'm on a mission to make the auditing world a better place. So we like your mission, but sleep. Yes, that's an order. Yeah, yeah, I, I'll I'll try to. All right. There may be one or two people who might make me take some time off. So <laughs> everybody's saying do recaps. Tania's like, yes, recaps. Stephanie is like, that would be great. And Debbie, we didn't see Debbie here. Debbie, Debbie says, yes, please do recaps. So I, we maybe we can find a few of them and see if we can find any good ones. I think yeah. the people have spoken. And B says, eat B. You don't have to worry about me eating. The sleeping part you have to worry about, but eating, you have no worries there, my friend. No worries at all. So, guys, another fun episode of the Friday Froster. Yeah. Remember, we're available on all your favorite podcasting platforms. Have a good weekend, you guys. <laughs>